Question 22 then starts with this statement that alcohols have relatively low volatility because of their intermolecular bonds and it just asks you to explain those statements. When you get questions like this, the important thing is just not to repeat the words that were in the question. So if you're talking about intermolecular bonds, you can't just say bonds between molecules because you haven't then explained the word in, uh, so you haven't then explained the word bonds. Um, but other than that, it's not looking for anything very deep. So low volatility, all you have to say is that it means that it's difficult to vaporise or that it takes a lot of energy to vaporise the substance. And intermolecular bonds, uh, bonds you can describe as attractive forces, so attractive forces between molecules is all you need to say for that. Part two then wants a bit of detail about those um, intermolecular forces in the case of ethanol and they've given you this diagram to complete. So hopefully your immediately thinking, oh, this is about hydrogen bonding. As soon as you see an OH, or indeed an NH or FH in a molecule, you know that that gives the molecule the ability to form hydrogen bonds, and that those will then be the strongest of the intermolecular forces it can form. So the dipoles it prompts you to put on, and remember they arise from the fact that oxygen is more electronegative um, than actually either the carbon or the hydrogen that it's bonded to. So you can put delta negative on there and delta positive on here. You could also put delta positive on the carbon, but that's not relevant for the hydrogen bonding, so you don't have to do that. Um, so let's leave it off just to keep the diagram simple, but th that's fine if you did put it there, because certainly it would be delta positive. Um, and then the same here, delta negative on the um, oxygen, delta positive on the hydrogen. And the point is it's an attractive force between the delta positive on one molecule and the delta negative on another. So in essence, it is just electrostatic attraction and you mark it on as a dashed line or a dotted line, not full length. It's not a covalent bond. And the final detail is that you have to remember that those oxygens each have two lone pairs and you're supposed to show the hydrogen bonds pointing directly at one of the lone pairs. So Oops, it's in the wrong place. So you can put the two lone pairs on like that, but the oxygen end of the hydrogen bond, it should be pointing directly at one of the lone pairs like that. And then it asks us um, whether glycerol you would expect to have a higher or lower boiling point. And of course the point about glycerol is that you, instead of just one OH group per molecule, you have three. Um, and so you've got three hydrogen bonds to break. Um, well, actually more than that, because both the oxygen and the hydrogen can be involved, but you've certainly got a lot more hydrogen bonds per molecule uh, because of the three OH groups rather than one. So that's going to take more energy and therefore the boiling point will be higher. Um, so it's only one mark, so you don't need to go into a huge amount of detail. You, all you would need to say is that glycerol will have the higher boiling point because it has more hydrogen bonds per molecule to break. If it was more than one mark, I would go into the bit about therefore requiring more energy to break them and so on. So question 23 introduces us to um, compound E, which is this. And it wants to know, first of all, about the two functional groups that it contains. It tells us one of them is a primary alcohol which is obviously that one. And it asks us what the other one is, and that's this. Um, and that, remember, is called an alkene group. Um, it does specifically say name the other functional group. So if you, for example, wrote that down, that won't do, because yes, that uh, that's identifying it, but it's not naming it. So that's um, got to be alkene for that one. And then it wants the test that you would do t to demonstrate that the molecule really does contain the alkene group. And the test for that is that you add aqueous bromine. You should specify aqueous there because that's the way you do the test. And it's best to say in the dark because, as you know, the overwhelming majority of organic compounds will work, will react with bromine if. Um, you shine UV light on it because they can then do radical substitution. But it's only um, alkenes, at least only alkenes that we've met so far, which can react with aqueous bromine in the absence of UV light. So that's why we say in the dark. And um, the observation is that the uh, solution is decolorized. 
if an alkene group is present. Um, yeah, or you could you could actually specify the color change, which is orange to colorless, if you like. So either of those would be fine. Um, but don't just say the colour changes, that's too vague. And don't say discoloured, because that just again means the colour changes in some way, but it doesn't specify. So either decolorized, meaning the colour disappears, or specify orange to colourless. Um, and then in part two, it wants the name of the compound. So we follow the usual um, method. Find the longest continuous chain, which is one, two, three, four, five, six carbons going through like that, so that's hex, and we're going to have two suffixes because we've got an ene for the alkene and an ol for the end. So we're going to call it hex uh, something ene something ol, um, specifying the positions of those groups and then we'll have to account for the branch as well. But start getting the main chain sorted out. So because we're putting all at the end, we want to keep this number as low as possible. So we're going to call that one carbon one and this one carbon two. So four, five, six like that. So you can see the alcohol group is on carbon one. So it's one ol and the alkene group is between two and three, but you quote the lower number. So it's hex two en one ol. Um, and that accounts for all of it, except for this methyl group which you can see is attached to carbon 3, so it's 3-methyl hex 2 en one ol As always with alkenes though, you've also got to consider the possibility of EZ isomerism, because if you do have EZ isomers, those would be two different compounds, and so the name must include the speci uh, specification of which one it is. So we look at the two carbons of the double bond and we ask for each one, does it have two different groups attached? So is hydrogen different from CH2OH? Obviously yes. Is methyl different from propyl? Obviously yes. So yeah, this can have EZ isomers, so you've got to decide which one it is. So we have to do the prioritising thing. So at this end that's easy, because hydrogen has atomic number one, carbon has atomic number six, so the directly attached atom has a bigger atomic number, so that's the priority group at this end. The other end it's not quite so straightforward because you've got carbon attached here and carbon attached there, so both of them have atomic number six, so that doesn't give you a priority. So then remember you look at the atoms which are two bonds away from this one, and these ones you've got one plus one plus one, okay, for the three hydrogens attached to this carbon. For this one You've got two hydrogens and another carbon, so you have one plus one plus six. Okay, so these ones add up to more than that, obviously, and so this gets the priority. Um, and so you can see that your priority groups are on the same side of that line that runs through the alkene group, and so we call that Z3-methyl hex2-ene-1-ol. So then in part B it's asking us about oxidising the alcohol group in this compound, and as we've already said, this is a primary alcohol. So with oxidation of primary alcohols, remember you always have this complication that there are two possible products. You can either oxidize briefly to form the aldehyde, or you can have prolonged oxidation and form uh, a carboxylic acid. So it wants, first of all, to know what the reagent is for doing um, that. And remember it's this, so learn the whole package, aqueous, acidic, potassium dichromate is what you need to make that happen. That's the reagent. Don't just say potassium dichromate because it doesn't work unless it's dissolved in aqueous solution and it's got lots of acid in there as well. And then it wants the structures of the possible products, the aldehyde and the carboxylic acid. Um, as always in these questions you then have the choice. You can either stick to the same format that they've done or you can translate it into something simpler like a skeletal formula and that's up to you so just do whichever one you feel more confident with 
um, I'll just put the skeletal formula up just because it's um, quicker. So um, the aldehyde um, is going to be this. So we've got CH3, there's the double bond, here's your propyl group, and in the starting compound you have that. Okay, so that's just a skeletal formula of this. And all that happens when you oxidize to an aldehyde, remember, is that you take away hydrogen from there and hydrogen from here, and in their place you put... Oops, that's not really neat. Let's try that again. You just put double bondo like that. Okay, so that's how you draw an aldehyde group in a skeletal formula. If you did it as a, uh, a more explicit formula like this, you could draw it like this. Okay, and that would also be fine. The other product is a carboxylic acid, which is what you get if you oxidize to another stage, and that involves changing this hydrogen that's left here on the end into an OH group. And so if you do it with this kind of representation, it's going to look like this. Make sure the bond connects the carbon to the oxygen, not to the hydrogen. You've got to be very careful getting those bonds right. And if you do it with the skeletal formula, it will look like all of that's still there, but now you have the OH there instead of a hydrogen. So those are your two structures. Part three asks you to explain the term refluxing or heating under reflux is the more formal way of saying it. Um, so if you remember that we've, we've drawn the picture of the equipment. So you have your flask, which is being heated. There's your reaction mixture in the flask. And the crucial thing in refluxing is that in the top of that flask, you put a condenser, which goes like this. It has the water jacket around the outside of the tube. Um, like this, and you put cold water in through there. And out here. So that's the basic setup for refluxing. It doesn't ask you for the diagram here, although one option to answer the question would, I guess, be to draw the diagram. But if you do that, you have to label it. So you have to label the condenser and the round bottom flask. So that's probably quite a big job if it doesn't actually ask you to. But they often do ask you, so it's important to practice it. So if you want to put that in words, you could say that you heat with a condenser placed vertically above the flask. So that just puts that into words. And explain what that achieves. So the mixture can be heated even for a long time. without losing material by evaporation. So that would be a good way of explaining what you're doing when you reflux something. Um, because anything that vaporizes, the vapor will rise up here and hit this wall in the middle there, which is kept cold by the cold water flowing around it. So it will condense back into liquid and drip back to where it came from. And then it asks us whether this is what you would do if you wanted to make compound G. So G is the carboxylic acid. And so the answer is yes. OK, so yes, reflux is good. Because to get to compound G, we've got to go from primary alcohol first to aldehyde. And then, and this second one is a slower reaction to carboxylic acid. So you've got to heat for quite a long time. And if you didn't reflux, the problem is that while you were heating all the time to try and get the reaction to go, all your material would just escape into the air. So yes, reflux is good because prolonged heating is needed. to get the carboxylic acid.
Part 4 then wants an equation for that oxidation of compound E, that's E drawn as a skeletal formula, and it wants the equation for oxidising that through to the carboxylic acid. So remember that in oxidation equations you use this magic oxygen to represent the oxidising agent. You don't even try to um, actually put the dichromate into the equation. So that's going to be your left hand side and we'll decide on the number of oxygens in a minute. And the product, all the carbon framework is the same, so it's the same down to there, but then instead of being an alcohol it's now a carboxylic acid, which means we have COOH, which is that. So that's going to be your product. Now what happens during the oxidation, remember, is first you go to the aldehyde, which takes the two hydrogens away from here, um, to turn that into C double bondo, uh, and those combine with one of the magic oxygens to form water, so you have H2O as your other product, so that's one magic oxygen needed, but then you need another one because you've got to go from CHO, which is the aldehyde, to COOH, so you're just inserting an extra oxygen there, so that's two magic oxygens altogether, but no second water produced. So that's going to be your equation. In part C we're focusing on the chemistry of the alkene group again, uh, because it's asking us about the addition of hydrogen to the compound. Um, that's not something you know about for um, alcohol, so you think, oh yeah, that's the alkene group that's doing that. Um, so it wants, first of all, an explanation of what the term addition reaction means. And as always in these explanations, you've got to try and avoid using the word that's in the question. So you can't just say it's a reaction where you add on extra atoms because they said, well, that's kind of almost restating the question. So you just put that idea of adding on in different words. So you say it's a reaction where the molecule gains extra atoms um, without losing any of its original ones. That's the important difference from substitution, because in substitution you get new atoms as well, but at the expense of losing some that you had before. But in addition, the molecule gains extra atoms without losing any of its original atoms. And then it wants uh, to know what the um, catalyst is for that reaction, so it's just a reaction with H2, and the catalyst is nickel. Um, but notice that it says name the catalyst, and again this is where you've got to be incredibly careful, because if you just did that, you might think, yeah I've answered the question, or if you just wrote NI, but you haven't named it, you've put the symbol down, so you've actually got to write the word nickel. Uh, you've really got to watch out for that, because you might think surely they're not going to be that petty, but yes, absolutely they are. So if it says name it, you've got to name it. Um, and then it wants the equation. And remember, all that happens is that the hydrogen adds across the double bond, like all these alkene reactions. So one hydrogen adds to that end, one hydrogen adds to that end. And so what you'll get is exactly the same carbon framework, still the OH group there, but the double bond has now lost its pi component and you've just got an extra hydrogen there and there. But if, of course, in a skeletal formula you don't see them, so that's the answer. Part D then is just um, a quick calculation to make sure your mole calculations have not got too rusty. So it's now saying that we've got 100 grams of compound E and it wants to know how much hydrogen we need to react with it. So, as always, your first instinct as soon as you see grams should be, oh, we've got to turn that into moles. So we get moles of E is mass over MR, which is 100 over... Um, you've got to work out the molecular formula of that in order to calculate the MR. Um, and this is where you've got to be careful with your um, skeletal formulae, because you've got to count the hydrogens very carefully to make sure you get the right number. So you could either do that using the, oh, you know, work out what the alkane would be and then adjust it to, to compensate for the for the OH and the alkene group. You could do it that way. Or you just go through and you just tot up how many hydrogens on each one. So you say, right, this carbon has got only one bond shown, so it will have three hydrogens to bring the carbon's bond total to four. So we've got three there, plus two there makes five, plus two there makes seven, 
none there because that carbon's already got its four bonds shown so we're still on seven three there goes to ten one here because there'll be one there uh, which takes you to eleven two there which takes you to thirteen and one there which takes you to fourteen so it's C7H14O is the molecular formula which gives you um, an MR of 114 so that lets you calculate the moles which comes to 0 0.877 moles and then you look at your equation and you can see that each mole of that according to the equation gets converted into a mole of that and just requires one mole of hydrogen to do it so that means that the moles of hydrogen needed is the same, 0.877. And so the mass of hydrogen is moles times MR. And this is one of those places where people often make an error because they just look up hydrogen in their periodic table and say, oh yeah, atomic mass is 1. But yeah, the atomic mass is 1, but we're talking about H2 here, not just H. So the molecular mass is 2. So um, that's 0 0.877 times 2.0 for H2, um, which comes to 1.75 grams. Here's your answer. And then part two wants us to convert this amount of hydrogen into a volume. And the key phrase in the question is room temperature and pressure. As soon as you see that phrase, you should be thinking that the key relationship is that the volume in dm cubed is equal to the number of moles times 24.0. That number is on your data sheet. Remember, it tells you that the molar volume of a gas at room temperature and pressure is 24 dm cubed per mole. And that's just another way of saying this. So, um, that's easy then because we know the moles is 0 0.877 times 24.0 gives you your answer which is 21.1 dm cubed.